we were discussing space partitioning constraints. We set up the space partitioning constraints for our example, for our running example. Uh, in one of the modules, we showed how these space partitioning constraints can be expressed in a graphical form. And from there, you can derive what things, what iteration points can be executed in parallel and which of them need to be serialized. And the, in another module, we discussed how we can formulate the space partitioning constraints for a given program, uh, for a given loop nest, mathematically. And then we discussed what are some poss possible solutions and non-solutions to that mathematical formulation. Now, you know, we're going to discuss what is a method to actually solve these mathematical formulations or these space partitioning constraints expressed in mathematics. And in the previous module, what we had done was we had just come out with a possible solutions and checked whether any of those solutions uh, fits for uh, our required constraints or not. But now we're going to try and come up with an algorithm that gives us the solution. So given a set of constraints, how do we arrive at a solution? So here are, uh, you know, for I'm not going to show you the program again, but I'm going to show you the corresponding space partitioning constraints that we formulated. And the space partitioning constraints recall were because of two pairs of accesses. One was xij and xij minus one, and the other was yi minus one j and y ij and and so if i look at these two pairs of uh, axes or statements one of them is a right and so what i can do is i can say that whenever there is a data dependence between uh, between this pair then it must be true that the corresponding iteration space points map to the same processor id and mathematically that means that for all ij i prime j prime which represent the iteration indices whenever i and i prime is between 1 and 100 and j and j prime is also between 1 and 100 and fi plus small f equals f prime i prime plus small f prime in other words if i equals i prime and j equals j prime minus 1 this is for x i j and x i j minus 1 then it must be true that c11 the c matrix multiplied by i with i j plus small c1 equals the C matrix C21, C22 multiplied by I prime J prime plus small C2. Recall that uh, ca uh, this ca capital C11, C12, uh, small C1, capital C21, capital C22, small C2 are our unknowns which form part of our uh, coefficient matrix for the, uh, for, uh, for the processor space. So the coefficient matrix multiplied with the iteration vector plus an additive small C1 small c gives me the corresponding processor id and so this is a function this represents a function from iteration space to processor space and so these functions for for whenever there's a data dependency these functions should uh, evaluate to the same processor id that's what this says and this was only for xi and xi xij and xij minus 1 here is the corresponding set of constraints for y i minus 1 j and y i j and the constraints look very similar uh, for all i j i prime j prime if they lie between 1 and 100 and i minus 1 equals i prime so this is the primary difference between the two formulations here capital f and small f and capital f prime and small f prime are different between the two formulations which gives here it gives me i minus 1 equals i prime because of y i minus 1 j so i minus 1 from y i minus 1 j and uh, i prime from y i j and uh, similarly j equals j prime so i minus 1 equals i prime and j equals j prime whenever these are true then it must be true that they map to the same processor id and that's exactly the same type of constraint that we have here now whatever our solution for these unknowns uh, c's capital c's and small c's it should satisfy both these constraints so that's the important part the other part here is that the only constraint, I mean, these i, j, and i prime, j prime are not the unknowns. Notice that there is a for all quantifier on these uh, these variables. And so we can just, you know, we basically need to come up with a solution which satisfies, uh, you know, which satisfies these constraints for all possible values of i and j and i prime and j prime. Okay, so, so how do I go about solving this uh, problem? And so I'm going to first show how 
you know how one could kind of start breaking down this problem for this particular running example that we are using throughout and when my next module i'm going to generalize this method to a general problem statement in general every problem statement will have space partitioning constraints of a very similar nature which means that there will be you know some quantifier over some number of iteration variables which will depend on the dimension of the iteration space so for all you know vector i and vector i prime uh, whenever if whenever they lie between within the address space so that's bi plus b whenever there is a data dependency so fi plus small f equals f prime i plus small prime plus small i prime then it must be true that they map to the same process id so ci plus small c equals c prime i prime plus small c prime so that's what my general space partitioning constraints are going to look like now the only question that is remaining is how to solve these space partitioning constraints and that's what we are discussing using an example in this particular module so the first thing to notice here is that i want to you know use gaussian elimination to eliminate some of these variables some of these uh you know bound variables the quantified variables so for example as i for all i j i prime j prime it seems like there are four dimensions uh that we have to worry about but notice that there are also constraints that i should be equal to i prime and j should be equal to j prime minus 1 and so i can just get rid of for example i prime and j prime and just wherever there is i prime i can just replace it with i because i know that you know i'm only interested in those cases when i equals i prime and similarly i can replace j prime with j plus 1 and so that's what i do here in this uh, in this equation i just replace i prime with a i and j prime with j plus 1 and this is my new equation so the only thing that i have been able to achieve is that through gaussian elimination i have eliminated some of the variables some of the bound variables so that uh, i don't have to reason about them and moreover because i have removed those uh, you know used gaussian elimination i i mean i have basically taken into account these two equations so i don't really need to i mean those equations are now encoded in this constraint automatically not only have i reduced the number of uh, quantified variables i have also not like i have also basically folded in the effect of these equations into my op, into my constraint similarly i can do this for the other uh, space partitioning constraint once again i cross out i prime and j prime and uh, replace i prime with i minus 1 and j prime with j and that's what i'm doing here so now i have these two set of equations it says c into ij plus small c1 c1 into ij plus small c1 equal c2 into ij plus 1 plus small c2 and here it says c1 into ij plus small c1 equals c2 into i minus 1j plus small c2 so notice that these two equations are identical except for the the part that has been written in green here okay so now i have these uh, these constraints these simplified constraints that have been simplified using gaussian elimination and now i'm going to solve try solving these simplified constraints so here is the first thing i'm going to do i'm just going to first consider this constraint here on the left and i'm just going to rewrite it so that i bring everything to the left as a uh, you know high school method of solving equations we bring everything to the left and collect all the coefficients for every unknown so for example uh, i and j are the unknowns so basically i collect the unknowns for i and i get c11 minus c21 so that's the coefficient for i similarly i collect the coefficients for j so that's c12 minus c22 and so that that becomes the coefficient of j and then the constant term becomes c1 plus c, minus c2 and minus c22 and that's coming c22 is coming because of j plus 1 right so the plus 1 here is basically showing up as c minus c22 here and so this equal 0 so this becomes my rewritten equation where i have just kind of collected the uh, unknown variables and their coefficients and moved everything to the left so that the right hand side rhs is written as 0 now the important thing to note here is that this equation should hold for all possible i and j that belong to this range now belong to this range is a little bit difficult thing to model so i can kind of over approximate in other words i can be more conservative i can say for all possible i and j for all possible integers i and j this must be true or in fact for all possible real numbers uh, i and j this must be true and if this must be true for all possible real numbers and i'm just you know if it's true for all possible real numbers it will be true for all possible integers in this range so i'm just being more uh, you know more conservative if i can find that solution then that solution is going to be 
uh, you know, good enough. And so what is that solution going to be? If this equation needs to hold for all possible i and j, it basically means that the coefficients of i and j and the constant coefficient should be all zero. In other words, this because this whole must hold for all i and j, it must be true that c11 minus c21 equals zero, c12 minus c22 equals zero, and c1 minus c22 minus c2 should also equal zero. And so that gives me equations only on the unknowns, and that's something that I can, you know, I made progress on. And so this is what my new equations look like. From this for c11 minus c21 equals zero, I get c11 equals c21. Similarly, c12 equals c22, and finally c1 equals c2 plus c22. So these are my constraints that I have collected from the equations that I had on the left hand side. Now I'm going to do a similar exercise from the equations that I have on the right hand side. And then I'm going to combine all these equations together and see what is the solution that, what is the maximum rank solution that I can get. Once again, I want to point out that everything zero is a feasible, is always remains a feasible solution. It will satisfy all these equations as well. It is a feasible solution. It's not, it's just not the maximum rank solution. It's not the best solution that we want. We want the solution that has maximum number of non-zeros. Okay, in, in the coefficient matrix, the additive uh, vector, we don't really care whether it's zero or not. Okay, so now we have collected these three constraints from the LHS constraint. So C, once again, C11 equals C21, C12 equals C22, and C1 equals C2 plus C22. Now I look at the same, uh, I, I do the same thing on the RHS as well. And I bring everything to the left, collect all the coefficients, and once again, I get C11 minus C21 for I, C12 minus C22 for J, and C1 plus C21 minus C2 for the constant term. And once again, because this must hold for all possible I and J belonging to this range, and then once again, over approximating, making it more conservative, uh, what I get is C11 equals C21, but that's something that we already have. So everything needs to be you know, set to zero. So C11 minus C21 should be zero, which means C11 equals C21, but that's a constraint that I already have. Similarly, C12 equals C22. That's again a constraint that I already have. So that it's not giving me any new, this new set of constraints is not giving me any new information so far. But here is the new one that's going to get, which is the constant term should be equal to zero. So C11, C1 plus C21 minus C2 should be equal to zero. And so that gives me a new constraint, C1 equals C2 minus C21. So just rewrote this equation uh, so that you know I bring C2 and C21 to the right and so I get C1 equals C2 minus C21. So these are the four constraints I get and now I'm going to solve these constraints using our uh, favorite Gaussian elimination. Now you know we can use any kind of Gaussian elimination solver to solve these but here is one easy way to think about it. Let's say C1 equals C2 plus C22, C1 equals C2 minus C21. So from these two I straight away know that C22 equals minus C21. I can just subtract these two equations and from that I get C22 equals minus C21. I already know that C11 equals C21, C12 equals C22 and now I know that C22 equals minus C21. So I know uh, an equality relation between all the four coefficient matrix elements. Okay, And so that's what it looks like. It says C11 equals C21, that's coming from here. C12 equals C22 that's coming from here and C22 equals minus C21 and so that's why I say you know I just made this a single equation which has C21 equals minus C12 equals minus C22 equals C11 and let me just call all these quantities small c right so C11 is small c, C21 is small c, C12 is minus small c uh, or I should say capital C sorry uh, let's, let's call this capital C because we're going to use small c later maybe and then and so on right so, so we just use c okay and so the coefficient matrices, uh, matrix uh, values we have no, it's you now it's let's say C. And so, uh, you know, for example, this will be C, this will be minus C. This will be C, this will be minus C. This will be C, this will be minus C. This will be C, this will be minus C. So we have all the four values and we can you know uh, for, for these, uh, except that we don't know what C is, we're going to figure that out. But we also need to worry about the constant terms. So for the constant terms, basically we have C1 equals C2 plus C22. So what is plus C22? That's just minus C. So I get C1 equals C2 minus C. So that's the other constraint on the constant terms that I can derive, which is C1 equals C2 minus C. So now I have these two constraints. One is for the coefficient terms and one is for the constant terms, additive terms. 
and now I need to solve for them. And what do I want? I, once again, you know, everything equals zero is a possible solution, but I want a solution that is maximum rank. And notice that solutions that are just of that are modulo some constant. So let's say if I say everything is two, that is the same thing as saying everything is three or everything is one. So modulo a constant multiple for everything doesn't really matter in this framework for the coefficient matrix. Similarly, for the additive vector, anything with a additive constant additive multi, uh, you know uh, value, for example, plus one or plus ten or plus hundred doesn't matter. You're just shifting the uh, values of the processor IDs, you know, left or right, uh, and that doesn't really matter, you know, but depending on the additive constant. So without loss of generality, we can pick the multiplicative values uh, co constant to be one, and the additive values constant, the unknown constant, to be zero, and then from there we can derive all the other values based on the constraints that we have derived using Gaussian elimination, and so what we get is. C11 equals C21 equals 1, C12 equals C22 equals minus 1, C1 equals minus 1, and C2 equals 0. And this is what it would look like if I just replace the values in the solution that I have obtained using Gaussian elimination and all the other things that we discussed, including you know uh, elimination of uh, quantified variables and stuff like that. Uh, we get you know, C11 and C12 are 1 and minus 1. Small c1 is minus 1, so we get i minus j minus 1. Similarly, these are 1 minus 1 and 0, so this gets i minus j. And so this is, these are the two solutions we get. T1 equals, T1 which map, which de de uh, determines the function for statement S1, basically is i minus j minus 1. And P2 which determines the function, uh, the PID function for statement 2, is i minus j and this is exactly the solution that we have been kind of guessing either through graphical method or just by hidden trial in our previous modules this time we didn't have to do any guessing or any graphical method but we arrived at the solution through a pure algorithm uh, but the algorithm was kind of you know uh, i showed you the algorithm by using an example i haven't really generalized the algorithm which i'm going to do in the next module so this is what uh, you know. This is what it looks like for S1. It's P1 that is mapping to the processor ID space. It's the same processor ID space, but uh, the functions are different. Uh, this is P1 uh, function, and this is the P2 function. Now notice that because of these P1 and P2 functions, some of the uh, iterations in S1, uh, different iterations in S1 may map to the same processor ID. For example, when I say i minus j minus 1, uh, both, you know, for example, 1 comma 1 and 2 comma 2 are going to map to the same processor ID minus 1. Similarly, when I look at uh, S2, then, you know, one again, 1 comma 1 and 2 comma 2 and 3 comma 3 and 4 comma 4, they're all going to map to the same processor ID 0. Similarly, if I look across P1 and P2, uh, the processor, uh, the, the, the state, the the iteration index of S1, which is 2 comma 1, would map to 0, and 1 comma 1 of S2 would map to 0. So 2 comma 1 of P, uh, S1 would map to the same processor ID as 1 comma 1 of S2. And so there are some, uh, basically the ranges are common uh, for some of these uh, domain points for these two functions within the same function P1 or P2 or across the two functions P1 and P2. And what we are going to, now the only thing that is remaining now in terms of code generation and program transformation is that we can create separate threads whenever the, uh, for every processor and make sure, and now we can run each separate thread uh, in parallel. But if two or more iteration points map to the same processor ID, then we have to, you know, we have to run them sequentially. Moreover, it's important that we run it in the same order uh, as that it was present in the original untransformed program. So the remaining thing is that if S1 and S2 map the, to the same P for some i comma j and i prime comma j prime, then their relative order must be preserved. The relative order in the original program. So if, for example, 2 comma 1 of S1 was executing before 1 comma 1 of S2, then uh, that, sh that order should remain preserved when my transformed program as well. And this is something we haven't really discussed. We are only discussing the mapping from 
statements to processor IDs. Uh, we haven't really discussed the code generation strategy. So just in case you're wondering, we are going to be discussing that uh, a couple of mod lecture modules later. So uh, please, uh, yeah, so, so don't worry about that if, if you are worrying about that. But we have at least solved the problem of what should be the mapping. And, and notice that in our map, when we are trying to get our mapping, we try to ensure that we have as many non-zero values in the coefficient matrix as possible, because when we chose, in this case, there was only one value to be chosen, and we chose that to be one uh, and and not zero, and so that's uh, that's where that's why it is a maximum rank solution. Also, I cheated here a little bit in the sense that I started with a coefficient matrix that had only one row, because I'm using assuming this information that uh, I know that uh, you know that the solution is going to be a rank one solution so there's only one, one row but in reality when you're going to ex uh, solve such constraints you will have a coefficient matrix of the you know of two rows in this example because the iteration space was of depth two and these uh, this solution is going to automatically give you a solution which says that oh by the way uh, the you know the second row can be a linear combination uh, can be a linear multiple of the first row and so you know it's still, still uh, even though there are four unknowns you would still get a rank one solution so with uh, with one row i got a rank one solution uh, i invite you to try this at home that when you, even if you try use two rows you're still going to get a rank one solution if you use the same method of Gaussian elimination and of quantifier elimination that we discussed today